Good morning, everyone. Namaste. In honor of St. Patrick's Day, I wanted to read a blessing to you. And um, many cultures, perhaps all cultures, have traditions of blessing. But I think in some ways the Irish have become rather famous for, for that um, gift of blessing and have extended that to the world. So I want to read from a book called Benedictus uh, by John O'Donohue. And I want to read you perhaps maybe one of his most famous uh, blessings. So I thought I'd read this, and some of you may have heard it, but I know for myself it never gets old. And then we could just sit in silence for a few min moments after and, and uh, just let it sink in before I begin the talk. It's called A New Year Blessing, Benacht, for Josie. On the day when the weight deadens your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you. May a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curac of thought, and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you. May there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life.
So I wanted to speak this morning about a few topics that were put forth and some some in the topics portion and other came up in, in dialogue. And I'm going to attempt to weave, weave all these together and we'll see what comes out. Um, uh, the topics relate to, um, you know, what is this what is meant by this, you know, statement of losing oneself? What does that really point to? And another topic was um, when we, when you might encounter a sense of nothingness, and uh, in, in particular in meditation, and kind of resting into um, what sometimes I'd call like the womb of the universe is right right down here in the hara and the sense of self as we um, typically identify with may feel like it begins to dissolve and let go into that nothingness what what might be a reference and um you know might might a sense of grounding be be a um, a support in that process, but also uh, a topic uh, came forward last night that I didn't really dir- address head on because conversation I intuited could go a different way. But the question was, you know, how do we know what's true? You know, how do we know that? How does that register? And so I just want to speak this morning and see how some of these topics might get touched upon some, maybe not in entirety. I mean, I don't even know if that's possible. But but um, just kind of touching on each of these, and we'll see how these topics may continue to live within us and perhaps be furthered by what I'd love to share. <clears throat> First, I want to mention that St. Patrick's Day has a particular meaning for me um, because, well, really for two reasons. Because um, my ancestry is Irish. Um, There's some sense of orienting toward a, a sense of clam and belonging. And uh, I think that that's something that may run through all human beings in a certain way, maybe not in just the way the Celt- Celts express it. But I think that there's um, perhaps some yearning that is in the heart of every human being to somehow be connected and belong to a greater whole. And um, I also find a particular um, special meaning for this day because it was on the date of St. Patrick's Day that Adya asked himself in, in meditation when sitting and listening to the sound of the bird outside his window, our window, he asked uh, the question, who hears this sound? And in that moment, the, the sense of himself listen, listening the, as the listener and the listening and the song being listened to, it all unified as, as one and the sense of himself as separate um, dropped away. And it was um, not simply a unity experience, but a, a absolute a shift in knowing what he essentially is and what we essentially are. And so I often you know, th- every time St. Patrick's Day rolls around, you know, I always wish him a happy birthday or, you know, because <laughs> it's a, a, 
a birth of sorts, and he even wrote me a note as such um, after it happened, because I was sleeping while it happened, and he wrote me a note before he left for the morning and said, today is my birthday. And so... In my, my own sense of returning to the ground of our true identity and having that very ground awaken and know itself through our incarnation, to have spirit consciously recognize itself as this manifest world. Um, in that experience of mine, which was more than an experience, but the experiential factor, it gave me a real sense of, oh, this is what home is. This sense of knowing that we are part of, we are an one expression of the totality, but also the entirety of the totality, essentially. And and so when we know ourselves essentially as life, the very essence and expression of life, then it's sense that we're, we're never alone or never separate from the totality of life. And so there was this, this moment where I said to myself, I remember, I'm home. And then my eyes got really big. Like, inter- like I don't even know if anyone's looking at me, but I was like, in insight, oh, I am home. Home itself. And so I think that that drive for connection or belonging or you know, I hope the safety that that we were talking about last night that can be supported by, you know, a sense of, um, you know, being circled around when we feel less, less secure, any one of us, and, and having that sense of, um, always being in the fold is, is really can point us to what is it to be to be in in the fold of of the of the whole that is essentially what what all of life is and so sometimes that that yearning can be many things you know it can be pesty <laughs> this yearning to to be be satisfied or to to seek to find to to come to satisfaction and some knowing that i can just finally have peace of mind peace of heart peace of being and sometimes that that yearning can give us reprieve and sometimes it revisits quietly is sort of as though it's just tapping on the shoulder or, you know, coaxing us to turn and look within. And sometimes it can be, you know, I feel like it has a, a spy of the shirt and like it's dragging us to to pay pay attention or to somehow um, <clears throat> give more of ourself or Ask what might it be to have less of a sense of identity and ego. But this very yearning is something that is kind of tricky because, you know, when we ask a question like, what do we trust? Or what, what is true, maybe? This was more the topic, I think, that came forward last night. And how do we recognize that? It's, it's amazing that it can actually come 
in the um, signature of yearning. You know, it's like, what? I trust yearning. And it depends how we um, relate with that yearning. You know, if it, if it has us and it, you know, it drags us toward one desire or another or another or another, and we, we assume that we are uh, a being of lack that constantly needs to be filled or um, satiated, then, you know, that yearning really, really um, is ruling us. But if we turn toward the yearning and, and really look afresh and give it a kind of respect and, and turn and say, okay, I'm listening, you know, what is this? And give ourselves to that. Then as we, you know, trace that very call of yearning to, to its source, it can find its satisfaction in our return. As can we. So, I think it's no secret, you know, to those of you who know me, even, even just a little bit, that I will often, you know, orient toward the body. And sometimes sensing what the body might register may, may seem um, not available or distant. It may feel like it's it's overridden with with louder impulses, but I think most all the impulses, whether subtle or more gross or loud, um, in the body, are all things that we might look toward and learn from. You know, one person mentioned the topic of pain. And I have to say that I don't uh, have a history of tremendous amounts of pain, although there's been times where I've had very serious injuries and surgeries and whatnot. So I have some experience of it, but not the, the long-going chronic pain that some people experience. So I'm not necessarily the best to speak to it, but what I can say of pain is, is that when the body is... is um, hollering, you know, or squawking. And it could be a yearning, as I said earlier, it could be a pain. It could be a, you know, an influx of adrenaline. It can be lots of different signals. But when it's when it's talking, it uh, it really appreciates attention and being listened to. And as much as we're able to do that. And I love how in one of the sharings last night, um Someone was mentioning how it can sometimes take time to even be able to have the awareness of registering these things. You know, sometimes we're so identified with them that there's no distance to be able to observe them or, or um, come from a different perspective that might care or attend to them. And that's really what we're doing in having all these periods of meditation here, is learning how to take a seat and take a, a posture and a, a, a vantage point such that whatever might be arising will, will begin to be felt as um, content that arises and presents and perhaps passes into our awareness. And from that very seat of stability that's not moving away or deflecting into activity or distraction to be able to, to see and face what arises and to get the sense that what is observing that is not inherently 
uh, defined by the content. And so, you know, over time, getting a sense of of what you are that's um, that feels perhaps more like the observing or the awareness of, you could say, the context in which the content arises. The more we get a sense of, of that and abide as that in our meditation, the more we have the, the capacity to, to listen and give our attention to these various signals of the body. And then <clears throat> all the lessons of relating, you know, are brought to bear. And as uh, one person mentioned last night, we don't always, we don't learn all the, the um, different ways of relating, and so certainly that's my experience. And um, although we, we learn quite a few, and so we can draw upon what we have learned and, and relate to these various signals that the body's presenting. Hopefully, not just with mind, but with our hearts and and our intuition and our sincerity, our instincts. And all of these are um, actually something that relate to this topic of returning home. So what I mean by that is if you were to think about uh, just hypothetically you know, a world that was all white without black. It'd be kind of hard to know white, you know? Or if a word, world was all black without white, it'd, it'd be hard to know white. But there's this way that the contrast helps us know. You know, like we, we wouldn't even know, you know, finding if we hadn't experienced loss. Or, you know, so there's these, this whole... Um, interplay th- all throughout life of opposites. And I was mentioning those at the beginning of the retreat as um, just being so interrelated that that they may not be as separate as we, we always, our, our, our dualistic mind may, may organize around, you know, like the listening and the speaking can, can be um, simultaneous. Um, you know, we exude volumes with the quality of our listening and convey so much. So there's a myriad of, of seeming opposites that, that come together. And there's a way that when, when we attend to our own direct experience, and recognize that sense of being present for experience, it also highlights and strengthens the sense of ourself that is presence, that is that which is available at being present to whatever our content of experience is. So not only might we be serving the very pain we're addressing or the emotion that we're looking at, for example, or the, you know, the person that we're talking to or whatever it is that we're relating with, we're also uh, serving the very um, expression of of awareness and presence that, that is doing that, relating. So how this relates further to this sense of return home
is basically through um, the absence of the signals that would um, evidence our separation. So this, the main signals that evidence separation would be, you know, a sense of grasping, you know, believing there's something wrong or lacking or missing, you know, or aversion um, um, from what is. Uh, a basic um, fear or assumption that what is is not is not sufficient or is not um, palatable. Now, relatively speaking, sometimes that's that's true, but I'm speaking more in an existential s sense. Meaning, sometimes you know, you're hungry, you need food, or you know, someone's acting inappropriately and, you know, it's appropriate to say, hey, I, you know, this needs to change or whatever, whatever you say. Um, but in an existential level, there is these mechanisms of, you know, grasping and aversion that evidence um, a kind of malalignment with reality. If we take on faith, and again, this is a little tricky, because I know sometimes the, the faith question, which came up last night, is tricky. But if we take on faith, and also from our lived experience, that when we do feel a sense of alignment and um, well-being, that sense of lack or wrongness or grasping and aversion isn't present. So it's not just faith, it's also experience. But um, in the moments where we don't feel that alignment, our past experience can evidence or, or can support a faith that there's something to return to. And sometimes in the very very presence of like feeling something's off is the very knowing that things being on or aligned exists and that's w why we know it's off by contrast kind of like the black and the white we need the opposites in order to to know e each one of them So this yearning signals something's off, something's not being remembered, something's not being uh, recognized, something's not foreground that, that feels missing. And so it, it's a signal that is trying to return our attention to that alignment with our wholeness. It's a call home.